Hey everyone, and welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Today we begin talking about the Fifth Holy Land Crusade. By the end of his pontificate, Innocent III had placed the Latin Church in complete control of organized Christendom. He announced plans for another crusade to the Holy Land, and this one was to be entirely church-directed. The Church would use another crusade to, in part, exert her dominance over Christendom, even while at that very moment they were using trained crusader soldiers to clear out the French countryside of the Cathars. If at any time the Catholic Church gained the absolute power it sought, it was at the time of the Cathar Genocide. It immediately began declining again as the Holy Roman Emperor gained strength around the time of the Fifth Crusade. Through the promotion of the Crusade in the West, Innocent expanded the benefit of the plenary indulgence and waived taxes and any debt for those that would commit to crusade. This time they would finally go into Egypt as the fourth crusade had intended. Innocent even expanded the plenary indulgence for individuals that could not go but would support or sponsor a crusader. In a way he had to. The Pope's plea had not really enjoyed the widespread attention of previous crusades and like his plea for the fourth, he didn't seem to have the words to get Europe invigorated like Pope Urban II had. Some of the disinterest was burnout and disenfranchisement. Many of the Crusaders had already been given indulgences for their participation in the Albigensian Crusade. Moreover, many of the Knights for whom the Crusade message was intended had been on the Fourth Crusade or at least remembered the debacle. The last two endeavors had involved subjugating, burning, and killing other Christians. Meanwhile, in Muslim Egypt and the Levant, the period leading up to the call for the Fifth Crusade was one of tumult. After al Salah ad dins death, his brothers fought a destructive civil war against his sons. ad dins brother, Al-Adil I, eventually came to control the lands of both Salah ad dins sons and completely disenfranchised them. Adil placed his own son, Al-Kamil, in charge of the important land of Egypt, right in the path of the coming Christian Crusade. The infighting in Islam seemed never-ending. There were constant attempts to overthrow Al-Adil and his sons. Salah ad-Din was still a legend in the Muslim world, and his sons still very popular after the ouster. The rise of two countries, Hungary and Austria, whose Holy Land Crusade commitments had been negligible, mostly due to internal conflicts, may show the fatigue among the previous generation of Crusaders. Yet one can't help but wonder what effect the continued genocide of Albigensians was having on the Crusade. What had it done to the political and spiritual motivations of the rank and file toward crusading? Andrew II of Hungary and Leopold VI of Austria took the cross together. Passion grew once again in Germany and in Italy where Frederick of Sicily, who would be the Holy Roman Emperor in short order, also answered the call to take up the cross. Before the crusade to Egypt could be fully planned, Pope Innocent III died. He was followed by Pope Honorius III, who rose to power with the same idealism toward crusading as his predecessor. Although notable kindness marked Honorius's approach to dealing with people compared to Pope Innocent's more ruthless approach. Planning for the Fifth Crusade saw armies begin staging. Recruitment continued as it had under Pope Innocent, and nobles took up the cross. To what extent the new pope impacted crusader morale is not entirely clear. However, Honorius had been the treasurer of the Catholic Church under two popes and had also been the official tutor of Frederick II, who was the upstart Holy Roman Emperor. No doubt these relationships influenced affairs. While Frederick had taken the cross, he was detained on business in Sicily, even as other armies were embarking toward Egypt. Andrew and Leopold set out for Cyprus, once again on Venetian ships. And while on Cyprus, Andrew and Leopold were joined by John of Brienne, the acting king of Jerusalem. It was not currently under Christian control. And he was also joined by Hugh of Cyprus and Prince Bohemin IV of Antioch. Muslim chroniclers don't give a lot of detail on whether Egyptian spies realized that at that moment a crusade council of war was convening on the small Mediterranean island. There can be no doubt that when the Crusaders arrived in Acre from Cyprus, that word quickly spread. From Acre, the Crusaders 
staged their forces to raid and probe Al-Adil's lands in Syria. It's not exactly clear why, once again, if Egypt was the goal, the Crusaders put in East in Palestine. Yet it seems probable that knowing the tension between rulers of the Islamic world, probing Al-Adil could provide a great deal of information about the severity of operations in the Levant facing them, and could also teach a great deal about how Adil's son, al Kamil, might respond from Egypt. The Crusaders met some resistance that November, but no major engagements until they fought a small battle with Aladil's army near Bethsaida. During their Palestinian operations, Andrew and Leo restored important fortifications near Caesarea. With the work of restoring defensive fortifications and establishing lines of supply and communication done, Andrew, considering this crusade commitment fulfilled, left to return home. Oliver of Paderborn arrived with German and Parisian soldiers sent ahead by Frederick until he himself could gain enough stability in his Italian kingdom to come himself. William I of Holland had arrived too. This gave the Crusaders a large enough force that despite the early departures from the field, they could turn their sights toward the goal of Egypt. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you next time when we delve into this character of Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, and his relationship with Pope Innocent III.